Viewer discretion is advised. Chapter 8 Retribution It had been five days now since they lost their good friend. Seth and Trevor were still shaken up. They weren't ready to give up on their other missing friends though. They were scouting the best they could while trying to maintain a low profile. It was bright and sunny out, with a few clouds off into the distance. The two were sitting against the house, talking. They kept their voices down, so no one could hear them. They had yet to come across anyone who spoke a word of English. Still, they didn't want to take any chances. If someone were to somehow understand them, the sick way these people walked around like Russian lapdogs had them pretty freaked out about those consequences. Okay, this one, Trevor said, without looking up, maintaining an inconspicuous behavior. Seth peeked from the corner of his eye. Way up the road, he saw a golf cart pulling a small storage trailer. Yeah, I see it. She's like a maid. Right, I've seen her deliver blankets and shit. Toilet paper too, Trevor nodded, acting as though they were just having your average everyday casual conversation. Yeah, that's the one. Seth hesitated. You sure, man? She's just like a housekeeper. Why would she carry a knife? Trevor responded quietly. I have no idea, man. I just know I saw it. While she was working a few homes down, just outside the red line, I saw a glimmer from the blade. Look, Seth, we looked everywhere we could without raising suspicion. We found Nothing. Nothing without contracting fucking tetanus. But we get something sharp enough 
and something long enough. We can at least try to cut these things out. He paused for a moment as they both grimaced over the unavoidable second painful surgery. Then, breaking one of his rules to review an important detail by looking up toward their target, he narrowed down a few points of interest to his buddy. She does four houses on this path each day, and she's been getting closer. See, she's doing that one now, then that one, then that one over there, and then ours. I'd say she'd be here in about 12 minutes. They both look down. She keeps it in her back pocket. Seth looked over at Trevor. So, I distract her. When I accidentally drop the toilet paper she hands me, then you bump into her backside. Sound right? Trevor nodded. That's the plan. That was when they both slowly stood up and headed inside. After a few minutes had gone by, they were sitting on the beds across from each other, trying to shake their nerves. I still can't believe how docile everyone is around here, Trevor complained. Seth shook his head in disbelief. Seems as though they're all drugged. Everybody's just living their lives like everything's normal. Shit ain't normal here. What do you think the end game is with these assholes? Joe was telling us that the clients the Russians work for terrify even them. Palko doesn't even seem to have a clue what he's involved in. And the Chancellor seems like he's pressed to meet their deadlines. Who the fuck do they work for? Suddenly they heard screaming. They ran out to see the same little girl that had an altercation with their late cohort. Two Russians were pulling her away from her crying mother. Seth lunged forward out of human instinct, but Trevor stopped him. They didn't even have to look at each other or speak. Trevor was right. Any attempts to rescue the child would just prove fatal for both them and the little girl. They watched as the Russians put the little girl in the back of one of their jeeps, along with other children rounded up from the community. They stepped back into their vehicle and while closing the doors sped off. This place is fucked, Seth said under his breath. She's coming, quick, Trevor whispered. Seth looked over to see the housekeeper pulling up in her cart. They tried the best they could to look casual as they avoided excitedly looking her way and calmly strolled into their enclosure. Within seconds, a pretty young Hispanic woman with long brown hair walked in after them. She didn't look like your typical maid. No uniform, no name tag, just a designated resident given a job by her jailers. She wore dirty, ripped jeans and a white, long-sleeved t-shirt. Seth watched as she passed. Sure enough, Trevor was right again. In her back left pocket, barely peeking out, was a black pocket knife as she carried a stack of blankets accompanied by two rolls of toilet paper. She placed them on the bed nearest the door while Trevor and Seth exchanged frustrated glances. Before they could execute their plan, and instead of her handing them the items she once held, a strategic part of their plan, she quickly turned around and ran to the window. They both looked at each other, completely at a loss. The maid carefully checked the entire area seen from the kitchen window that looked to the street and then turned around to face the two. She reached both hands into both her front pockets and pulled out a pen and a paper and spoke to the befuddled pair with her thick Hispanic accent. You read, you write, and I take back. Trevor and Seth, still extremely caught off guard and confused, both moved in towards her. Trevor snatched the paper from her hand while giving her his best what-the-fuck look he could muster. They both read the paper. Scribbled on it were a few words in some very familiar handwriting as Beck's voice sounded in their ears. Wait for my signal tonight. Three taps. You ladies ready to get the fuck out of here? It was just outside the all-too-familiar building. It wasn't too long ago. She was near this complex with her friends, scoping it out, attempting to achieve a safe pathway to their destination. 
Being back in front of it now, though, hands bound, and being ordered around like a slave, was extremely unnerving. The partial cover of clouds in the sky were not enough to block the piercing sun, which caused her to squint her eyes. As she was escorted down the capital steps of Esmeralda, she saw, just outside the gates, a bus full of other folks, appearing to be just as frightened. From her scattered sights, and while being pushed towards the bus, she assumed was for her. She noticed something. It appeared that the passengers all had their hands up. It didn't look right. It looked odd. It was as if they were all praying, their hands all folded, raised over their heads. The guard kept pushing her, speaking Russian, as they closed in on the impending nightmare with their hostage newcomer. It was Anne. It was a small school bus, still mostly yellow on the outside, but rusted and peeling in several spots. She was finally forced to the open door and made her way up the first couple of steps of the shuttle. Still being barked at in Russian by the soldier behind her, Anne was able to now peer in and absorb the alarming view within. She was crying and trying to appeal to the man pushing her up the stairs. She kept asking about Beck and Caleb and Delilah. She asked where her husband Eugene was, saying his name several times over. All the responses that kept being shouted back to her were just in Russian, sometimes loudly interrupting her teary efforts. She kept repeating their names. She wondered where they were or why had she been separated from them. Finally, at the top of the stairs, she looked around being forced to proceed down the center between the other passengers. The driver was another Russian soldier who just patiently waited for his last fare to board and take her seat. The seats inside were made of a brown leathery material and were completely torn and scratched up. She noticed as she made her way down the aisle, everyone was bound just like her. They all seemed to be older people, similar in age as herself but no one appearing to be much younger. She didn't really pay much attention to this detail, however, as she noticed the more chillingly eerie sight that made her skin crawl and her blood turn cold. There were dull hooks hanging over all their heads. Each one of the riders had their bounds hefted over the hooks that had given them the prayer-like posture she noticed from outside. They were all quiet, much quieter than her anyway. As she still let out pleas and cries, the shouting soldier followed closely behind. They sat in the seats next to each other, two by two, docile yet petrified. Each one of the windows, as she passed by them, were positioned completely open. This was likely to remove the foul aroma of a dozen or so people cramped together, appearing to not have seen a shower in a number of years. Eventually, she came to an open seat, next to a man who seemed to be no older than 50. He wore raggedy cut-off jeans and a yellow sleeveless shirt with a pair of sandals. He also had his hands bound, which were hanging on the hook above him, his arms raised high over his head. He also wore a seatbelt, but she noticed there was no visible buckle. The Russian hung his assault rifle on his shoulder and swung it around his neck as it came to a rest on his back. He stepped in front of Anne, who was looking at what she thought would be her seat for the unforeseeable future. He grabbed her by the wrists and hefted her bounds above the hanging piece of metal until it fell into place within the cradle of the hook as her arms stretched uncomfortably above her head. Сидеть. Сиди сейчас. He ordered in Russian. She assumed he was telling her to sit down. Her eyes closed, flushed with salty tears. She hesitated and pleaded once more, letting out a pathetic whimper. She did. The Russian yelled once more, obviously ignoring her solicitation. She did see chess. Anne finally caved and promptly took a seat. The Russian knelt at her side and began fussing with the seatbelt on her other side. He swung it around and swiftly pulled it through the underneath of the backrest, jarring her waist back into the seat. She heard him fussing with it a bit more as metal clanking noises began to sound. And then, finally, 
the unsettling sound of it clicking into place. She was now locked into position, like the others, her torso completely stretched to the limits, unable to move her bound hands or loosen her belted waist. She began desperately crying out as the Russian made his way back to the front of the bus. Please, don't do this. Please stop. Where's my husband? Where's Eugene? She continued to bellow. The attempt for sympathy was completely unheeded by her Russian detainer as she managed to plead another question. Where are you taking me? The Russian froze. It was almost as if he understood the last question she desperately cried. This development made her calm down slightly, but in an uneasy manner. Was he angry with her? Did she push him too far? Was she being too disorderly? What measures of discipline might he usher back her way? She noticed the driver watching her in the large rearview mirror. He just shook his head and started up the vehicle. The Russian, who froze at her last inquiry, turned around and briskly walked up to her as she gripped the cold metal hook above her head in fear. He then leaned down to her level and said one word. It was an English word. A word he seemed to have recited for just such an occasion. With a lowered voice and a thick Russian accent, he finally obliged her latest inquiry. Fidlat. Did he just say Fidlat? What on earth could that mean? She wondered as the bus slowly departed. Anne watched through her blurry, damp vision, onset by the wetness of salty tears as the capital of Esmeralda became smaller and smaller. Meanwhile, back in Trevor and Seth's new neighborhood, the two men were standing in their little run-down shack of a home. The maid patiently waited as Trevor knelt on the ground, gripping a pen, thinking of something to write on the piece of paper laying in front of him. Seth, a hand on Trevor's back, looked on anxiously, awaiting the author's words to appear. Trevor began to write, understood. Tonight, we will be standing by. Trevor, still kneeling, looked up at Seth, who blinked and nodded, signaling a positive review of the short novel. He then changed his glance to the impatient, rightfully paranoid maid, who had shifting eyes darting amongst her surroundings. Cued by her growing sense of urgency, Trevor quickly handed her the letter. She hastily grabbed it, beckoned for her pen, and placed the contraband back into her pockets. The maid then did an immediate about-face and expeditiously vacated the residence, her knife still in her back pocket. Very perplexed and somewhat humbled by the rescue's announcement, Trevor and Seth nervously smiled at each other. Well, that answers a lot of questions. They're still close by, at least Beck is, anyway. Seth stated in a hushed tone, Trevor was deep in thought and looked at Seth, not afraid to dramatize his puzzled expression. How on earth is she gonna get to us? How the hell did she find us in the first place? Immediately, they both terminated the conversation as they heard a car come screeching to a stop just outside. They ran to the window facing the road. A Jeep was there. Shit, had they been caught? Two men stepped out of the vehicle in familiar military uniforms. The driver stayed put, just outside his door, armed with the typical assault rifle they all seemed to carry. The other one, unarmed, at least for now, opened the back door of the car and gestured for the occupant to disembark. With that, Trevor and Seth saw a young female get out, possibly in her early twenties. She was dark-skinned, looked like possibly a previous local of the town, and had long black hair. She wore loose-fitting black pants and a dirty light pink tank top. The unarmed officer didn't shy away from being rough with the young lady as he ushered her to the covered carport attached to their home. Trevor and Seth looked at each other with more confusion than before as they backed away from the window. They were now standing in the middle of the room as they moved their sights to the incoming sounds of footsteps approaching their battered doorway. Soon, a woman who had a tired face entered the room, followed by her aggressor. 
The Russian looked at the two men, grabbed the woman by the arms, and without caring for her comfort, pushed her up against a wall near the first bed frame, like a police officer would do in an arrest. After face planting into the wall, she turned her head and observed her environment through the corner of her eyes. The Russian, while forcefully holding her, looked at the two men and started speaking Russian. He wasn't yelling or shouting or even barking orders. It was as though he was simply having a conversation with them. To both Trevor and Seth's shock, the soldier then let go of her, grabbed her jeans, and yanked them down along with her underwear. Her removed clothes dropped around her ankles, revealing a transmitter that seemed to be a major fashion in the community. This time, something was different. It was ever so slightly different, but seemed to scream out to them. There was no blinking blue light. She stood there, not seeming to be shocked by the sexual assault that she just endured, and just stayed still. The Russian then pulled out an electronic-looking wand-like object from a cargo pocket off his right leg and waved it over the woman's transmitter. Three loud electronic beeps sounded from her device, and a familiar blue light began to blink. This detail must have been something Trevor and Seth missed when they had arrived, most likely due to the fact that they were hooded at the time. The soldier then gestured to her exposed rear end and said a few more things in Russian. He slapped her exposed behind, causing her to grimace, looked at the bewildered pair, and smiled as if proud of the prize he was offering them. Then, just as he arrived, he regained a rigid face, gave them a stern look, and walked out of their home. The two just looked at the half-naked, heavily breathing woman, aghast at what they had just witnessed. She stayed put, eyes open, and paying close attention to them still viewing them through a side angle, her face still mostly positioned away. The three observed a moment in stillness as the sound of the Russian vehicle made its departure. Seth ran up to the woman and grabbed her pants to pull them up. With that, she aggressively took over and took upon the personal task herself. Abashed, she faced the two and walked in between them to sit on the bed. She put her head in her hands and let out a long, exasperated sigh as she slightly wept. Trevor looked over at Seth and mouthed a few words. What. The fuck. The cabin was dark, later that night, as Seth and Trevor sat on the floor, leaning against the bed frame nearest the door. Planning for their friend's arrival, the two had already prepared the door, as it lay against the wall hanging by only one lower hinge. They watched their new roommate as she lay on the bed opposite them, facing away. This new development had them at odds. They knew that Beck was planning on something tonight, and they didn't know if they could trust this newcomer to tag along, so they were wary to wake her. If she doesn't hear the signal, we shouldn't try to wake her up either, Seth whispered, continuing the conversation they'd been having. Trevor agreed. And if she does, he said, sweeping in a moment of reticence. They both thought for a while, then Seth broke the lull with the best rebuttal he could muster. Take her with us? Trevor put his head between his legs and drug his fingers through his hair. God, why now? Why tonight? Shh, Seth softly sounded. They both looked up at the sleeping female stranger as she tossed in her sleep suddenly. They sat on edge and looked on as they watched. Then, to their relief, the young woman fell back into her previous sleepy patterns as they both let out nearly muted sighs. What do you think she meant? Seth asked. Trevor looked over at Seth and gave a slightly confused stare. Seth continued his line of inquiry. Three taps. A look of understanding came to Trevor's face as he considered the question. On the window? He answered. They both looked at the small window to the back of the house, where the stacks of blankets had previously been neatly folded upon their arrival. How is she not gonna get caught? Seth said, continuing to try to understand Beck through the mind of her brother. Trevor, having had the same question rattling around in his head for half the day, didn't have any good answers. Who knows? Maybe she hasn't had the procedure yet.
Maybe she made her escape early and they can't track her. Seth shrugged. It was about as good of an answer he could get with the little information the two had on hand. They sat there in silence as the two watched the shadows in the room shift across the floor, obedient to its lunar conductor, orchestrating the shady waltz from above. They wondered if Beck was going to be able to come through. They worried for her safety, wherever she might be. Just then, they heard a small tap. They froze in place, only able to hear the sounds of their own breath and heartbeats. They waited, anticipating and hoping to hear two more light taps. And as if that had spurred the next thing to take place, they heard it. Another soft tap. This time, not caught off guard and listening to find the location of the expected but still strange noise, they noticed it was coming from the wall near the bathroom. Suddenly, and hopefully not from the slight disturbance, their bunkmate began to jostle once again, letting out a few snores in her sleep. They focused on the blanket, heaving slightly up and down, covering the unconscious young girl as they watched her return to her routine slumber. Then, one last time, another small tap against the wall drew their eyes up and over. They both looked at each other and softly rose to their feet. They began to walk outside while their hearts began to race, warning them of the madness of their plan. After seeing the demise of their close compadre, they didn't want to amount to another example of what becomes of rebellious behavior for the surrounding community. As they peered outside, they cautiously made their way through the covered awning. They soon began to feel the vulnerability they were being submersed in as the moonlight illuminated the two conspirators. Knowing that the sound had come from the other side of their hostel, they gradually made their way around the back. They made sure to stay down while staying close to the dilapidated house as they rounded the last corner before coming to the same wall where they heard the sound originate from inside. You see her? Trevor whispered, trying to stay calm and quiet, hoping not to alarm anyone. Seth looked around, his eyes almost fully adjusted to the distant dark shadows of wilderness that sat behind their domicile. He noticed a fence. Nothing too extreme. Just an old wire, property fence, probably built with the shack many years prior. Beyond the fence, the earth began to descend into a wash full of vegetation. The reasonably sized cove threw cascades of dark, dense shadows throughout the riverbed. He continued to scan the area when something caught his eye. There, Seth whispered, the two still by their designated living quarters. Trevor immediately looked to where his friend was pointing and noticed a small hand waving at them, just on the other side of the weak barricade. It was Beck, and she was looking right at them, maybe 30 to 40 feet away, summoning them to her location. The two quickly looked around, scoping out their environment, assuring themselves they hadn't alarmed anyone to their covert mischief. Convinced they were, to this point, undetected, they began to run to Beck while maintaining hunched over postures. They eventually felt comfortable as they arrived in a blanket of darkness provided by the tall surrounding fauna. They were finally reunited with their rescue-wielding teammate. Trevor grabbed his sister, palming her face in his hands by her cheekbones, and gave her a kiss on her forehead through the openings of the wire fence. How? her brother demanded in a gleefully hushed tone. Beck looked at Trevor, reached behind her, and pulled an object out of her pocket. She brandished a very familiar item the two of them had recently laid their eyes on earlier that day. It was the electronic wand the Russian used to activate the woman's transmitter in their house just hours ago. Beck smiled at them. Ever see one of these bad boys? Trevor and Seth rolled their eyes whilst smiling and shaking their heads in sheer disbelief at her ingenuity and resourcefulness. Wait a minute. Where's Eugene? Beck quietly asked, with a desperate urgency to quicken the mission at hand. Trevor and Seth, feeling an immediate punch to the gut, shared a momentary glance, and then both gave Beck a look that told her everything she needed to know. Her face fell, and her eyes grew a sadness that expressed both sorrow and anger 
for her abrupt loss, as well as an apologetic tone for theirs. As if to have a period of calm for the fallen, but keeping it to only seconds long, knowing there would be time to grieve later, they proceeded with their task. They immediately lifted both their right pant legs, exposing their transmitters. Taking their cues, Beck got to work right away. She proceeded to wave the wand over her brother's transmitter first. Just as expected, three loud electronic beeps instantly sounded, alerting the three to the disturbance they were making. They all looked around and stayed quiet for a moment. Nothing. Beck then proceeded to do the same for their friend as she waved the wand over his extended hind right leg. Again, three loud beeps, and again, they quieted, looking about, scoping their surroundings for anyone catching onto the three schemers. When they were convinced that all was well, Trevor and Seth raised the top wire of the fence, while Beck held down the lower wire. The two made their way through the thin barrier, Seth going first and Trevor close after. Once the three were officially rejoined, they all made their way deeper into the dark thicket of the wash, moving quietly while maintaining a sense of urgency. As they trekked the muddy, grassy wash, they debriefed one another of everything that had happened, maintaining a muteness to their conversation, being sure to execute stealth. Trevor and Seth explained what had happened to Eugene, and also described the bizarre occurrence that had happened earlier that day with the female stranger. The bizarre story struck a personal nerve with Beck and made her feel momentarily sick to her stomach. She, on the other hand, didn't have any helpful suggestions of the whereabouts of the two children or even Anne. She explained that when they were separated on the plains outside the underground lab, that she was bound, gagged, and blindfolded just like the others. She continued to explain, to their dismay, that it was the last she saw of the missing three. It was clear to the both of them that she wasn't happy not knowing the fate of her adopted twins. Sure, she was worried about Anne too, but she emphasized her anger at the lack of knowing where Caleb and Delilah might be. As she continued to divulge her bad news, Upon Trevor and Seth's inquiries, she began to explain her lucking upon the electronic wand she came equipped with. The beginning of her story sent the two into the memories of their own familiar and recent pasts. She was being transported in a truck, seated at the driver's side rear. Two other women sat to the right of her. All three had hoods over their faces and their hands tied behind their backs. Later. Outside the vehicle, just like Seth and Trevor, the hoods were removed. One of the Russians became completely occupied with a conversation over his radio. The other stood guard over the three. They were all standing outside of a dilapidated structure when Beck noticed something. Another jeep sped by them, also carrying three passengers in the back. She watched as it made its way up the road before disappearing into a darkened covering way off in the distance, provided by an awning attached to a house. She had a suspicious feeling the Jeep was occupied with at least one or more of her friends. How many hostages could they possibly house in one day? Over the course of the next few days, she watched a slew of weird happenings unfold around her. In one of these instances, Russian soldiers raided their home she had shared with the other two women. They grabbed one of the girls by the scalp and drug her out of the house, ordering her to walk to their car. She watched through a window as they stopped the girl for a brief moment. One of them pulled a wand from their pants pocket and waved it over the girl's transmitter. Then he put it back and pushed the female inside the car. Then the two soldiers got in and they drove off. She witnessed this occur a few more times in houses nearby. She also described something they had seen as well. Children being thrust into a car, ripped from their homes before being transported away. But she saw something they hadn't seen. The next day, she saw a child this time being dropped off to one of the same homes. After a couple days, the inevitable occurred. A Russian barged in and took her away. But Beck 
had a plan. Once in the Jeep, her hands tied behind her back, but with her transmitter disabled, she wondered where she was going. She paid close attention to her surroundings as she charted the area, keeping in mind where she thought her friends had been taken a few days ago. Not long after they started driving, she noticed the wand was sitting on the console between the two men. This may be easier than she thought. She noticed it vibrate away and began to think quickly. She waited for the most opportune moment as the vehicle hit rough terrain and made her move. She quickly bumped the device with her knee and caught it with her feet. She then slowly crawled the device up one of her pant legs. The car slowed as it turned up a driveway. The man in the passenger seat pointed to the house while speaking to the driver. Then they both stepped out and the front passenger came around to her door. He opened it, grabbed her by the arm and roughly pulled her out. He began to escort her up to a house she assumed would be her new temporary dwelling. She had to get rid of the evidence. She assumed he would eventually reactivate her transmitter, soon realizing the absence of his wand. She had to think quickly. She dove out of his grip and ran to a muddy, grassy area nearby, all the while the Russian yelling. While her back was turned to him, she came to a sliding stop while falling to her knees. She leaned over and began to heave. While pretending to spew her guts all over the mud, she allowed the wand to slip from her pants and onto the ground where she forced it into the wet soil with her knee, all the while maintaining the charade of simply needing to throw up. She now heard the two soldiers laughing at her and speaking to one another, likely mocking their hostage. Satisfied with her impromptu assignment, she gathered herself up, turned and walked back to her counterparts. As she approached them, they became serious and began yelling at her as one of them grabbed her by the neck and forced her into the house. She was greeted by the sight of a Hispanic man around her age or slightly younger. He seemed to be an indentured community member as well. He was kind of chunky, very dirty, and not exactly in line to win any upcoming beauty pageants. Then, for some reason, to her shock, the strange man began loosening his belt. She felt very uncomfortable by it, and felt it to be very odd and out of place. She could hear her detainer rummaging through his pockets. She knew what he was looking for, as her heart began to pound and butterflies filled her stomach. Eventually, he shouted to his partner, who moments later came through the door. They exchanged words in Russian, likely trying to figure out what's become of the missing wand. The newly arrived soldier forced Beck up against the wall and began to pat her down. Not able to find the missing item, he said some words in his language, appearing to be disappointed in his partner's lack of responsibility in the matter. Then he reached into his own pocket and pulled out a wand of his own and proceeded to reactivate her transmitter. After that, he left and headed back out to his car. After being admonished, the remaining soldier took hold of Beck and slammed her on the bed. She could see the new stranger waiting patiently in the corner of the room. The bed was under a window that was shattered and there was glass covering the window seal. She began to panic as her worst nightmare gradually began to unfold. Her aggressor began violently removing her pants. She responded by putting up a fight, but with her hands still bound, her attempt was immediately subdued with a gun now held to her head. He continued to undress her, completely ripping her pants and underwear down to her ankles, leaving her face down, the bottom half of her body laying completely naked and exposed. The Russian said a few words, loudly directing them at the stranger, announcing the man's new roommate. Then, to her surprise, he cut her loose as he rose to his feet. He got up, walked across the room, opened the door, and left. Beck was partially in tears now, completely confused at the transpiring events that were taking place so rapidly. She listened as she heard the Russians talking just beyond the shattered window above her head. She heard two vehicle doors slam as the sound of the engine sped off. Knowing that they were gone, she tried to gather herself together as she rose to her knees and elbows. Just then, 
she was forced back down to the bed, a hand forcing her head into the bare mattress. She could feel the stranger's body and instantly knew he was now completely unclothed. He reached around her waist and hefted her up as she felt his member slide between her legs. She began to shout as she tried crawling away from him. She reached up and without thinking, grabbed a piece of glass and flipped on her back and slashed the man's chest, tearing deep into his flesh. The stranger immediately lunged back and fell flat on the floor. She knew this wasn't enough to stop the assault. She followed him down to the ground, still half naked, her pants around her ankles and shoes, and landed on the man, both her knees on his stomach. She knew he probably couldn't understand her, but she didn't care. She began yelling at him anyway. She held a large piece of glass in her hand, which was causing her to bleed in the process, and put it up to his neck, piercing the man's skin once more. If you even so much as look at me here on out, it won't be your chest you'll be holding. It'll be the open sack that used to hold your testicles. The stranger, now flaccid, retracted to a pudgy, pathetic ball of whimpers and whines, pleading for his life. The three proceeded along the wash as Beck finished her story. She told them that over the next 24 hours, she didn't sleep, assuming the creep would attempt another assault. The next step was easy for her, as she befriended a maid and pleaded with her in her best Spanglish she could conjure up. As she did her best to appeal to the woman by describing her lost children, she successfully won her heart and was able to convince her to form a line of communication between her and her parted friends. This was her surest way of determining that she had the correct location of her separated team's whereabouts. I'm sorry you had to go through that, Beck. Trevor said to her with remorse in his voice. Why the hell are they arranging these bizarre forced conjugal visits anyway? Seth asked as they continued on. They were following Beck's lead this whole time, assuming she knew the way. While navigating the three through the brush and focusing on the trail to be blazed ahead, she answered Seth with her only guess. Keep producing product, I suppose. Trevor added to the conversation. Sure, but who's fucking benefiting? It's not as if anyone has any money to spend, right? I mean, as cynical as it sounds, human trafficking makes a lot more sense when someone on the other end is paying for it. Seth's thought process quickly brought him to his best conclusion. I suppose protection and supplies could be a form of payment, right? But this reasoning simply fell flat for Trevor. Why would the Russians need to reach out for protection and supplies? There, at the top of the food chain, it makes sense for someone like Palco, or even a small cartel faction. His logical comment put the brakes on the conversation making it hard for Seth to retort. Shh. Beck softly sounded as she put a hand up, signaling the two to quiet down and stop. We're here. They looked up over the rise of the wash to their right. There was a glow of light emanating from above. The three closed in on the dark incline and dropped to their hands and knees. They cautiously crawled up the wash's banks as a vehicle came into view. This is the exact same hill gramps Eugene and I came up when we first arrived here. Hold on a sec, Seth exclaimed in a whisper. We arrived here in crates, he said, as the three approached the top of the wash. Then he realized what she was talking about. She meant when they first arrived on the Chancellor's shores, before they had made their passage through Esmeralda's and onto Zancudo. He looked up and took in a gut-wrenching view. It was the Beltran Leva complex, which was once the capital of Esmeraldas. Holy shit. Those fuckers brought us back here. He looked on and saw that they were looking at the capital building from the rear end, a view he had not yet had the opportunity to see. Trevor and Seth looked at each other as their minds began to race. They now realized they were back in the clutches of the Chancellor. <laughs>